So uh, what I want to do, I just, I'm very fascinated with that uh, transformation of uh, narratives, especially to local contexts and also what I call uh, vernacularization processes. And so I will just draw quite deliberately from some, yeah, some materials I have worked with and just uh, hope that that will be a good basis to, uh, yeah, to discuss and to maybe find out more about some of these uh, uh, techniques of adaptation. So I will talk about text, but I also will try to um, include images. Uh, naturally, narratives uh, have their limitations. So theoretically, you can unfold the narrative indefinitely, like a narrative filibuster or so. So one monk decides, no, I don't want to hear the other monks talking, so I just go on forever with my story. Uh, but usually that's not like that. And of course, um, narratives are often also codified, even if they are um, even if they are performed orally, there are probably also some uh, conventions and codification in the mind. And about what uh, we can't talk much about oral versions because they did not leave um, often too, uh, too clear traces, of course, in the historic material. So I will look at how, how these narrative texts were transmitted and also uh, yeah, how they might relate to images. So, th so these uh, practical restrictions, of course, have to do with the media, material supports, uh, the narrative appears on, and so on. Uh, and uh, also very importantly, the conceptual space. Uh, we already have talked about that, I think, in several of these discussions. So it's kind of a narrative which has a certain background, uh, cultural background, certain topic. And then, as we know, in Buddhist narratives, they're all often transplanted to other spaces, to other locations, and also other conceptual um, uh, spaces. Um, so uh, yeah, a new location, and you will often encounter new conceptual ideological frameworks, paradigms, uh, which will, uh, as we will see, and of course was shown already, uh, in many studies and also during this um, uh, during this uh, workshop, um, the, the, which will impact the content structure. And what I'm very interested uh, in, and this may be not discussed so much often, but also genre and linguistic uh, registers. Um, so with other words, the programmatic, like a Sichuan is a wonderful place to study image programs or text programs. So, and programs often have this, uh, also have a form a kind of pragmatic environment, uh, which will deeply affect sometimes the narrative. Yeah, for me, a narrative in itself is a fluffy and soft thing, <laughs> maybe a bit comparable to the linguistic uh, animal uh, postulated by uh, Chomsky, which is also has a soft belly, as to say, uh, and is difficult to grasp. Uh, and narratives are also, as we have seen, also these different versions of a story. They are different, difficult to grasp sometimes. Yeah, what is their core? What is their exact message? And often they just assume solid features when they encounter certain spaces, um, uh, materials. Uh, textual forms or conceptual environments. So I just tried to <laughs> visualize that, maybe not very successfully, and also tried to uh, assume a core of a narrative. And for me, the narrative core is something which makes one narrative different from another one. Uh, otherwise, how would you distinguish them? And sometimes the textual or the image references are so minimal, like we see again, Kizil, we have heard a lot about it today. And here you have somebody with the bowl ta get, taking out water from a pond. And then the informed viewer, uh, these are the Jatakas, which are relatively easy to identify. The informed viewer will immediately know, oh, that must be Shyama Jataka or Sama Jataka or Shanzazin. 
uh, who fetches water for the parents. So they immediately will identify or somebody drawing a bow and shooting an arrow, also a core element. And they also know, oh, that's Shyama being shot by the king. Uh, and then you have other elements which might disappear in certain versions or be added. So the others, this thing is very, very flexible. And then often the narrative manifests in a specific form at a specific uh, location in a specific context. Um, yeah, of course, I will not go into that. Uh, just some examples of this. Uh, for example, the Shanzi thing uh, we will look at. Uh, I would have loved to talk about other Jatikas, but the problem is you only have five, six major Jatikas in East Asia, which are appearing at many places. I'm not like in Kizil again, where you have hundreds of narratives, um, and uh, but in East Asia more as a whole uh, to compare, you have to go back to this main, uh, to this few uh, Jataka stories. Of course, with Buddha's life, it's different. But for example, when we talk about Jataka, there are only a few of really over regional significance, which you can compare. And I like the Shyama Jataka also in addition. And of course, we already have heard about many constraints, whether narrative image appears at the steps of a stupa, of course, or as here, yeah, as an in independent text, like in the Shanze Zing. So when you see the Zing in these Chinese versions, then you know it's kind of a Jataka Sutra, <laughs> as they say, that basically means that Jataka circulates independently. And then it's quite, free to puff up kind of, you can tell a long story, usually only restricted that you want to put it on one scroll, like one tian, because you don't want to carry around many scrolls, I guess, for the same story. So that's uh, maybe the, but you can write a lot on one scroll. So the Shanzi Zing is very uh, long, very nice story, very elaborate. Uh, and sometimes, Often I, I deal more with the contraction of narratives, but sometimes with certain material supports, you also see new elements or expansion. Uh, for example, here the Shyama Jataka in Maiji Shan in Gansu, uh, quite, and also many other places in Dunhuang later, northern, uh, northern China. And we know uh, also the, the, the non-Han non rulers uh, of Northern China, they loved horses. So when you have a good story, you must have a horse in the story. And many earlier Shama narratives, the, the, the king is walking, but this you cannot really sell well in this area. So uh, they draw on, in, on, on narratives where there's a horse and uh, they also introduce the party, the hunting party, with great pleasure, uh, because uh, this you really don't find in the Shama texts very well described, as far as I know. Uh, but here, like in this image, they, you see they have several scenes uh, directly dealing with the beautiful landscape, with the animals there, with the hunting party, with the, the, the hunting itself. So here you expand on a peri peripheral, element because you can do it, you can stretch it out and you also have the conceptual space for it. Uh, the, the aristocrats or the, the rulers, they loved hunting. So they want to have it in their uh, depiction and they will also increase the joy, I guess, to view that. Um, but uh, I want to introduce something uh, which I did a while ago. So I'm myself not quite updated. But I compared, compared the Shyama Jataka, uh, all the ver versions together with Jesse Pons, we also tried to extract all possible scenes and see which scene is appearing where in an image and in a text. Um, that's a while ago. Uh, but uh, what I want to focus on today is the comparison between the Shanzi Zing, uh, this independent text, and uh, the version appearing in um, this Fayun um, Julin, uh, which is like an encyclopedic work on all kinds of aspects of Buddhism. And there they had to squeeze the story into form to fit 
yeah, because there are many, many stories and a lot of, it's a huge work, but each part only can occupy a certain space. And um, uh, what fascinated me, yeah, then you also have the Liu, uh, Liu Du Zijing we already heard about today, uh, where you also contextualize it in the terms of the parameters, like the practice also um, transforms and only focus on certain scenes, which can also um, highlight this uh, interest in the parameters. Uh, but we look at the Fai and Julin, and a while ago, I compared them and I found out it's very, you, you can just take the shans zing, and then you just mark the passages which uh, appear in the Fai and Julin, and you don't have to change anything. So it's, I never thought about this technique. So they just delete and extract and uh, there's a few pa passages they rephrase, like here uh, below in this light color. And what they extract are in this shaded color. You see, they are not interested in the frame story. Uh, so they just delete it. And here they start picking uh, the characters from the Shan Zixing. Guo Qi, Shi Shi Yu, Pu Sa, Ming. And then they introduce the main character. So that's their frame. And they don't change at all the, uh, the, the sequence of the characters. So this is really a fascinating technique of uh, reducing um, a narrative without having to, to do too much creative work, basically. <laughs> uh, so here, this, uh, they're more in, uh, interested, of course, in the, where it comes from and his character and so. So here, they uh, more is remaining from the Shan Zixing. Uh, but as you see, I don't go into detail. Uh, and uh, here they rephrased because otherwise the <laughs> story would be incomprehensible. So they have to introduce the name, of course, and say, yeah, uh, he was uh, born to a blind father and mother, and he had to take care of kind of the main, one of the main informations so he can unfold his filial piety. And then here again, a lot of moral qualities just deleted. <laughs> And they just say uh, he was Xiao, the um, filial, and Ren Si, and he also practiced the five good deeds. What the five good deeds are is uninteresting <laughs> in this. Uh, so they just deleted. And then again, important day and night, he would exert himself to, uh, yeah, Shi Fu Mu, to serve father and mother like a person serving heaven. So very nicely. So that's the main message. And it's really, it looks simple, this technique, but it must be a lot of understanding and practice behind that to leave that, the base text in as it is and extract uh, in the sequence of the base text, just the most important for the purpose, most important uh, passages. Sometimes it goes a bit wrong as one as I found out, but usually it seems quite, um, uh, successful uh, technique. Uh, yeah, I just shows them. Um, uh, and this also goes into on the linguistic level. So these syllabic words become monosyllabic. Uh, eight characters become four, and they also manage to preserve the rhythm also by reducing proportionally uh, and in order not to disturb the Chinese rhythm of reading in four character phrases often. Uh, yeah, here they changed some characters just to, um, uh, to, to, to make it more readable. And also quite interesting, sometimes it also goes on the grammar level, the construction verb, ob verb one, object one, verb two, object two is just contracted. So that's already, uh, they do that also without changing the text. So this is really quite uh, advanced. Um, yeah. Here they deleted a lot because it's like summing up the story. So they kind of have enough with the main message. Uh, so this is quite fascinating because that not many languages you can do that with. Um, and Chinese with an immediate constitute, constituent structure and lacking grammatical morphology, you can have this mechanical technique of textual adaptation. So this is um, really fascinated me and I have not looked uh, how they do that with other texts, but 
with the transformation of the Shanzi Zing to the version in the Fire and Julin, this is quite um, uh, fascinating and quite clear that they use that technique. Um, they reduced a lot, but then they also want to add, uh, make space for some additions, and there they drew from another conceptual space from the Tsar Baozang Zing, the supposedly a translation, Samyukta Ratna Pitaka Sutra, but it looks very adapted to a Chinese audience for me. Uh, so it's kind of an update for the Chinese audience to introduce a text which they know is uh, very much uh, composed to the likes of the Chinese audience. Going back to Bao Ding Shan, uh, we heard that the Bao and Zing for the filial piety tableau, which, uh, uh, which uh, Professor Kuchera showed yesterday is very important, uh, but uh, many elements actually come also from the uh, Bao Zhang Zing, uh, Zha Bao Zhang Zing. Uh, for example, the, 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 the filial uh, parrot, uh, so it's also a story. So you see here, they call it Avadana, so we will have a discussion <laughs> with Henry afterwards, uh, but uh, uh, there are a lot of Avadanas which deal with filial piety in that scripture. Uh, so it uh, fits perfectly for the purpose of a Shyama Jataka to complement it. Uh, another, so I, randomly, I, I just chose some examples. What interests me, the visual, visuality of the text itself. Um, so for that, I take a text, I've, it's very short, but I've worked on it for quite long because it's so complex, so it's a short, a uh, version of a very weird version of Buddha's life on a manuscript in Dunhuang. And uh, when you see, the, look at the edition, there are many things you don't see anymore, isn't it? Uh, so I, I went back to the text to really try to look at it uh, very careful, uh, careful. And uh, so there's so much information in this visual uh, presentation of the text on the manuscript. So this, I think, is very important when you when you use uh, textual material, uh, trying to go back to uh, versions if there are which are visually uh, accessible. So of course, with the Dunhuang manuscripts, we are in this fortunate um, circumstance that we can do that. And actually, in the editions, there are several Chinese editions, but they sometimes totally ignore some of these very important features, what you see, uh, and you see a lot. So the, the paper quality, of course, the, the structure arrangements, um, they just reuse the paper to, to, uh, with some Chan poems and then just edit that. So it's very informal, a very informal calligraphy by a very experienced writer, uh, but very informal, very uh, special character forms many of them semi-cursive or vulgar, demotic, Sioux characters, uh, a lot of phoneticized characters, which shows us that it's an oral text originally probably. So Chinese characters are used for their pronunciation and not for their meaning. Uh, a lot of dialect pronunciations from Northwestern medieval Chinese, a lot of colloquial vocabulary, non-systematic literary structure, so a lot of lo logical in inconsistencies, and also a non-canonical uh, con contents. So I'm just in the final um, stage of uh, publishing a paper on that, and but there are still some things I'm not quite clear about. And the context of usage, probably for storytelling, so it might have been a storyteller or a maybe a monk or in, not in schooling because the writing is too elegant, uh, but um, it might have been a storyteller and just making notes uh, what to, how to, to tell Buddha's life to a Chinese audience, maybe on the marketplace or somewhere. Uh, yeah, and some wonderful uh, variants. I don't know if you see my cursor, like Qi Nian, this for year, like this big bell in Yen. So probably it was a very good harvest this year in Dunhuang. So he used a very rare, in Dunhuang, very rare uh, cursive uh, character form for Nian, which is like nearly a circle and a full year, basically. 
and very, very uh, many other strange characters. And if you look here carefully, um, this is a passage where the Buddha puts a ring on his future wife on the finger of her. Um, and uh, you see this circle and another weird uh, symbol. And then you see the deletion of those probably by somebody reading the text because he figured out these are not characters, they're extra te te textual. And uh, so I asked already dozens of people, but nobody could explain and the editors totally ignore it. Uh, so it's just between golden, a golden uh, finger ring. So I figured the round thing is maybe the ring, who knows? Uh, but the other, um, uh, this kind of weird thing down here, this, I, I couldn't figure it out. Does it is hint on marriage, like uh, tying something? Somebody said the circle might be the Dharma and uh, setting it in motion, because in this version, the, the wife is very important. She's practicing together meditation with the Buddha, actually, in this version. Uh, so if somebody has seen something similar, please uh, tell me uh, these two symbols here. Um, yeah, and many of these are lost in addition totally. And when we go back here, the editors also don't note that this phrase here in the end is there's a gap. So that just connect the sentence. But for me, it's quite clear that this is also not part of the story, but it's addressing the audience. So expounding this, and this is usually anaphoric, referring to what has been said before. Uh, in the end, everybody would attain uh, the supreme. So that's often in Tunhuan context, when you listen to a sermon, to a lecture, uh, to a performance, then you also will, uh, can reach the ultimate. So it's like a shortcut, soteriological shortcut, but the editors just connected to the other sentence and then it becomes like something Buddha teaching the Dharma in Tushita heaven, which doesn't make sense. Uh, he, he hasn't been to Tushita heaven to teach his mother was another heaven. And um, yeah, it's a weird text, but it seems also the Buddha goes to where he comes from to Tushita heaven. So here that's where the main text ends. He goes to Tushita heaven, uh, a sense. So maybe they also mix something up with Maitreya um, uh, narrative. So maybe it was a storyteller who actually was not very versed in Buddhism and just made up basically partly a story which he knew would be very attractive for a general uh, populace. So the magic word here also in Sichuan in many sites here is vernacularization. So you transform something into a different register and also that, that what we see a lot in Anyue and Baudingshan things are depicted differently, they're described differently than all the other places we know. And that means you go under the radar of canonization of fixed patterns of representation and, uh, uh, and this vernacularization project, which, uh, which you can do very locally. And Dunhuang, of course, one can say also was localized Buddhism. Um, and a lot of vernacularizations of the narratives there for regular people. Uh, so very similar maybe context as in Sichuan. Uh, so this also seems to make you freer in your form of expression. Uh, and uh, also you can introduce elements which are not introduced uh, somewhere else. So of course has to do with localizations. Do I still have time for another yes. example? Okay, good. Yeah, another, um, yeah, for my recent paper, uh, which also fascinated me, and that's Mara's attack and temptation from Yulin Cave 33. That's the um, next cave, <laughs> which uh, the, the nearby cave, and there's a metal tunnel drilled between these two caves by somebody destroying a lot of tableau. I don't know when that happened. Uh, but uh, so at next to cave 32 uh, with some Mandapada and Manjushri and uh, also in that cave. Uh, but what I focus on is this Mara, this tableau on Mara, which is quite fascinated, fascinating. 
and also because of this new design, which started somewhere in the high tongue, uh, of annotating the tableau with side panels and sometimes on the bottom too or around. So you kind of contextualize the main narrative, which is on the uh, Mara Sepek. So everybody knew that, of course, a very famous story depicted dozens of times. And then I don't go into detail, they introduce new element down here. Three sages or bodhisattvas where the earth goddess should be or a fallen soldier. So um, nobody really has clearly identified these three figures yet here, whether it's multiple earth gods or we don't know, uh, or at least I don't know. Uh, but here we focus on this quite not very nicely painted uh, side panels. So the main uh, painting is really quite nice and okay, but the side panels might have been also another painter and there are also some problems in the representations. Uh, so here's just uh, 12 scenes uh, and it's quite nice because I tried to, uh, to figure out yeah, why do they do that? And then I figured out it's exactly what you find in the contemporary uh, vernacular literature based on the performance. So when you, for example, have a performance or narration on uh, like the poem of Yen, a very famous one, very, because it's dramatic, the crushing of the Mara transformation, which is a transformation text, uh, you have exactly the same structure before you come to the main topic, you sum up the life of the Buddha because they like to divide it in scenes. For example, eight main scenes and Mara's attack is one of them. And you see that in the literary structures exactly the same way they introduce the topic. So in a few words, abandoned the royal practice, uh, went to Himalayas to practice meditation or no, with the, with the um, uh, austerities, and then he took a bath uh, in uh, in the river. Uh, he got this auspicious grass to sit on. Uh, he got the milk and so on. And the four kings offered arms, and that's exactly what you see. Actually, those are a bit difficult to identify, but most of them you can identify. Uh, but then you have a, because we talked about Nirvana. You have a very weird nirvana scene up there with that. Maybe you can see it better on the other slide. Yeah, it's difficult to focus on. But it's like somebody just sitting there lying in the grass <laughs> and for a picnic or so. Uh, but, but that's the nirvana Buddha. And then that did not complete uh, what could have been maybe a stupa or a palace. And then you have a little weird figure in the background, like a demon. Uh, so I, I don't know any scholar who really has clearly tried to make sense, uh, identify that. And, uh, but this is just, uh, um, yeah, what is observed often in Dun Huang, uh, it, it does not match sometimes. Uh, the painter did not really read thoroughly or, or read the instructions how to paint it, or he was unfamiliar familiar with it, so he just painted something. So some scenes are very clear, the, 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 horse, like the leaving the palace, but some also down here and here. Yeah, here's probably auspicious grass and here probably something meeting the, the cow herding girl and then some milk is gushing forward and into the bowl so she can serve it to the Buddha. So it's really uh, also slightly vernacularized versions in the image. Um, yeah. So, uh, but you see uh, also in the text, this is like the introduction and then uh, it comes to the main, main part, the, the, the focus. This caused tremors in the Mara palace. And at that time, what words did he speak? And there the narration starts, isn't it? So the performer then imitates Mara. He saw this and that, was very frustrated. And then Buddha thought this and that, and then the girls came, the daughters, and they were very filial, of course, that's very important. And they do all this to help their father out of filial piety because they're 
really good girls, really, but they are forced to tempt the Buddha. Uh, so it's a very nice story too, but in terms of structure, uh, it seems very much this framing, uh, which appeared in Dun Huang in the, from the Haitang, is like uh, in parallel to these new literary structures of the transformation texts, which developed in the ninth, 10th uh, century. Yeah, here's another very uh, famous, um, uh, or maybe the most famous um, uh, example uh, of also Amara, the, the, the famous silk painting from Misei Gime, and you also see on three sides, you have annotations here a little bit differently. This was discussed a lot in, in scholarly literature and probably it focuses on the magic powers of the Buddha. Uh, so these are not auspicious statues, probably, but they are uh, magical performances, walking through a mountain, flying, uh, walking into fire uh, over a lake without drowning, and so on and so on. And so, so it emphasizes the element of magical rejection of the attack and the temptation. And then you have the seven treasures of the Chakravarti in India here on the bottom. So probably making a link to the king or the, the king, the, the, the aristocratic or kingly or support by the emperor of Buddhism. Let's have in the end another look at Shama and let's go to, to uh, one of these main uh, areas of Sichuan, Tatsu, uh, what we, um, uh, Professor Kuchera introduced so nicely yesterday to us. And you see the filial piety tableau, which is probably one of the most famous ones, as Professor Cochera said for us, but for, for other audiences in the 18th, 19th century, they did not really uh, care about that, but they would go to, to other places that more interest in that. Uh, and uh, yeah, she also talked about the, um, that you get overwhelmed by the size. And actually when you stand in front of it, uh, you actually just see the, uh, uh, you can read the, um, uh, the passage about how relics are very important. And by extension, text image, because Buddha is gone. Uh, so here's a statement on uh, that's, uh, and they say, Wu uh, Shi, our master. That's also, you see that in Dun Huang, Buddha is with the pronoun. You don't see that in canonical literature too much. Our Buddha, our master, so it's really personalized. His golden remains, bones, they were like 100 times they were burned or destroyed, but they always will come back like new or fresh. So that's what you see. And then you see other elements like the cycle of lives, uh, of, of, of realms and uh, main icon and also yeah it's nice to show it's really for viewing so it is in that angle so when you raise your hand you you can see a lot so it's not like in Dunhuang these family caves but it is for uh, people to see and not only when you stand in front it's like you you see it all when you go around you also can see it as a totality from the other side and I want to go back to our Shanzi uh, filial piety uh, story and see how this presented there and then have a, in the end a very short look at the uh, uh, Mahasattva Jataka where he offers his life to a hungry tigress so she can feed her little tigers and um, it's one of the scenes uh, two scenes among 12 scenes of filial piety illustrations either drawing on Jatakas or on Buddha's life. Uh, here's the line drawing. And actually here you see um, the scene of Shama and you see again, here's a refocusing going on. There's nobody shooting at him or he does not fetch the water, uh, but he's, uh, the story uh, most importantly in this context is the relation to the parents, isn't it? So the part of the story where Shama is dying and the only thing he thinks about is, oh, I cannot serve my parents anymore. That's terrible. I commit the sin. So I asked the king to take over his 
uh, role. You see the king on the side, so they are talking, discussing uh, how they should arrange that um, because of the death of Shama. Um, and here again, the local, also here, the physical restraints, you have to fit that on a slab uh, of rock, uh, like a tablet. And here, very different from the, uh, on, of that other text, Fire and Julin. Uh, they are rephrasing, retelling the story in a short way, uh, but in a very nice and complete way, slightly vernacularized the language. So probably also common people can understand when somebody reads it for them, if they cannot figure out the characters, uh, but it's very nicely phrased. It's like a complete unit, shorter than the Shansetzing, but it all has all the important elements. Um, yeah, so you see a structural analysis, the framing and the main story or the main uh, topic in red and then uh, the, the, the mentioning of his filial piety um, and, and so on, and also the introducing uh, the parents and even retaining the frame which this Fire and Julin people were not doing. So in the end, even the identification, uh, this Shansa, this has, is, my, is myself, like in a former life, uh, the Buddha says to Ananda. So they really, it's a complete structural version, uh, but just with a shorter phrasing. At the end, uh, we see, because I got very surprised, and other scholars too, what is the Mahasattva Jataka doing in the filial piety uh, tableau, isn't it? It's not about filial piety, it's about dana, it's about giving your body uh, to, to another being, like many other stories, so to the tiger in this case, the prince gives himself to the tiger so the tiger can survive and feed the small tigers. And um, so there's no element you see other places when you typically depict the, 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 this Jataka, usually you see somebody falling into a cave or something and below is the tiger or the tiger eats somebody. Uh, but here, what do you see? You see the bones and the text has become a table. <laughs> so the text has become a three-dimensional thing and uh, which you also can use in your uh, three-dimensional depiction here or semi-three-dimensional. Well, this is really three-dimensional. So they put the corpse, the, the tiger was very sorrow in eating uh, the Mahasattva, so there's only the bones left. Uh, and the bones are lying on the text, <laughs> uh, stone tablet, and then you see the parents. So this is uh, not the, usually the main element of that story. So how do you make that, how do you manage to, to, to twist that story? And here we need the text. The tiger is just on the side. This <laughs> doesn't look very scary either, probably because he's not hungry anymore, has eaten already. Uh, the Mahasattva, uh, but here you really need the text, otherwise you don't understand why is the filial piety, but when you read the text, you understand, so you need the text, and here actually the main plot is just summed up in one sentence, uh, the Ma Mahasattva, uh, Prince Mahasattva gave his body to help the tiger, that's it, and all the remaining is about the parents, so uh, why is it filial? Yes, because he gave his body. He earned a lot of merit. He learned so much merit that he could go up to Tushita heaven. And in Tushita heaven, he kind of uh, got enlightened. And then based on that, he could come down to his parents and teach his parents about Buddhism. So this is the filial piety element. So it's a filial piety, which is in beyond the normal one, isn't it? because he helps the parents to reach uh, enlightenment. So it's a Buddhist uh, filial piety. Uh, so this is really quite fascinating. So the depiction of the tiger has become peri peripheral and the parents mourning the death of the son has become the core topic in addition to the descending spirit. Um, the main plot of the story is basically summed up in one sentence. So the focus of the story shifted from the gift of the body 
to attaining merit and as an helping the and helping the parents as an act of filial uh, piety. So you see this adaptation on multiple levels, on the textual level, on the image level, and in the merging of these two uh, media. So only the merging of these two media make this reinterpretation uh, possible. Uh, well, that's it.